This is a show about bicycling in general and specifically about bicycle safety. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank our crew, too, uh, in the control booth that makes our show happen. And tonight we have Tim Goodall here from Isla Bikes. He's going to talk to us about some children-specific bikes, bikes that are made, made and designed specifically for children. And Portland being such a bicycle-oriented town, we uh, really want our children to be riding with us just for the fun of it because we don't want to miss out on riding. And it's a form of exercise and maybe a means to get to school. And so how, how do you buy a bike for a child? And I think we'll, I know I, I intend to be informed here tonight with Tim joining us. And uh, we do advocate for safety and so we'll talk about bicycle safety with our children and uh, talk about Tim Goodall happens to be here from England and maybe we'll get some interesting points of view from him on the Portland bike culture as somebody that's not from here would, would view things. I want to thank all of you who are signing up for the Beaverton Banks and Beyond Bicycle Tour. That's Northwest Bicycle Safety Council's big event that's coming up on August 24th. And it leaves from Papa's Pizza in Beaverton, heads out to North Plains, out to Banks, and up the beautiful Banks Vernonia Trail to Stub Stewart State Park. And you can go on to Vernonia. So I hope that you'll sign up and join us. I'm going to watch a video here in just a moment about registering for the event and it's time to get that done so that you're signed up and ready to ride with us. So again, that's on August 24th. We're going to go to a video now about registering for Beaverton Banks and beyond and then we'll come back and talk to our guest, Tim Goodall from Isla Bikes. <music> so you can see how fun and beautiful our ride is and I hope that you'll sign up and join us. We're working hard already to put on a great ride for you and I hope that you'll join us and, and get signed up. And um, now we're going to meet our guest, Tim Goodall, and he's here from Isla Bikes and he's going to tell us exactly what that is and welcome Tim. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for joining us. And um, now you don't seem to, you haven't spoken, so our viewers don't know you don't have a Northwest accent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, so, well, moved to Portland four months ago from Shropshire, which is roughly halfway down the Welsh border on the English side. Um, so very rural by comparison to Portland. I think there's a population of 10,000. Um, so sheep will vastly outnumber people. <laughs> So. Well, welcome to Portland, yeah, thank and, you. and boy, you're really acclimating yourself to our area. Having talked to you, you really know a lot, you know more about the Portland area than a lot of us natives do. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and, and why you happen to be in the Portland, Oregon area? Mm, sure, so um, we'll come on to sort of more about exactly why, but it's to set up the U.S. arm, if you like, of Isla Bikes. Uh -huh. um, so in terms of what I've left behind, sort of family, obviously parents, brother and sister. Although my sister's travelling all over the place, so you don't really get to see her much anyway. And hopefully my brother will come and study in San Francisco in a couple of years, um, which would be really nice. Um, and other than that, 
so well, I was just talking to you beforehand that mum's Danish, uh -huh. and so I think she's perhaps got some empathy with her son leaving <laughs> um, the country altogether because she did it when she was 20, uh -huh. 20 odd, so that she could learn some more English. Um, so we're naturally raised to be bilingual, um, which is great because we've got a very large family in Denmark, um, so at least you can talk to your cousin th cousins uh -huh. and things. Uh -huh. I often think it'd be more useful to have learnt Mandarin, <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, tell us about your own cycling interests before you left England. What mm. kind of cycling did you do? Well, it... I actually started out sort of cycling, doing more of it because I was dinghy sailing as a youth. Oh, okay. Um, and I read a book by Ben Ainsley, who was a very, still is a very successful British sailor, and he suggested cycling as a means of getting fit. So, I thought, hey, that sounds like fun. So I went down to the local store and bought a road bike. And cycling is just so much more accessible. You roll out your front door and you're doing it. Uh -huh. Whereas Dinghy sailing, as much as I loved it, um, you know, you had to get to the lake, set up the boat, etc. Um, so one thing led to another. Looked at the local cycling club, went to a ten mile time trial, ten tens, twenty fives. Is a um, sort of commonly known, and certainly in England, I'm not so sure about here. It doesn't sound familiar. Okay. <laughs> um, I went to that and met Isla, who obviously subsequently set up the company we'll talk about, uh -huh. but she started coaching me as a junior on sort of a one-to-one -one level pretty much and prescribing a training plan every week. So I raced as a junior, sort of road racing, time trials, cyclocross, um, and that I kind of petered out after the junior racing. I think put a bit too much pressure on myself to get results. Uh -huh. It was, I was very results driven at the time and I want, as I think a lot of people probably did, wanted to be the, the first Brit to win the Tour de France. Ah, now, okay. for anyone other than Bradley Wiggins, it's a bit late now. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so afterwards I kind of realized that it wasn't going to happen. So I sort of wandered away from cycling so much, obviously still doing it regularly, but mm -hmm. not every day. Um, well, you, and now you say you, you don't have a car. You're one of the mm. Portlanders that doesn't own a car, so you have to travel by bike. Yes. So in the last few years, I've come back to riding an awful lot more. Um, there's always been sort of commuting, um, but I guess riding just for the pure pleasure of riding, going out for hours into the countryside, uh -huh. um, and then racing a bit more as well. And then on the racing side, without the pressure results, just going out enjoying it and oddly enough you do much better anyway. <laughs> well good for so. you I, and I'm glad you're finding all these things here locally. Yeah, it's so accessible. It's like the racing up at the International Raceway on a uh -huh. Monday night. You, uh -huh. know, you do a normal day's work and you ride up, race, go home and it's, it's fantastic. Um, and then I think as you get older your interests naturally Alter, so the yes. next thing is a bit of cycle touring, I think. Oh, good. Sort of Eastern Oregon certainly yeah. looks like it. Yeah. I know it's quite barren, but that kind of the wilderness appeals to me. You can, I'm sure you'll find a good route. So, yes, I hope so. <laughs> so, what have you enjoyed particularly about joining the Portland bicycling scene? Mm. Well, one of the things that I still remember now, the first time when I got here in the middle of February, obviously, it's pretty grey skies, wet, but what struck me the first time I cycled to work, although it wasn't quite work in the way it is now, <laughs> was that the cycling infrastructure. Um, obviously I know Portland's, you often hear the media here comparing it to some European cities mm -hmm. like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, but from where I was coming from it was just having a, a painted line in the road was fantastic. And being able to ride 60 or 70% of your routes within a painted line. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not that you always feel harassed by cars, but people in cars, but you feel like you're holding people up. Whereas when sure. you're in a bike lane, 
you don't so much. They can easily pass yes. you and you're not inconveniencing. Maybe I'm just being too sensitive to holding no, people up. But, but yeah, that's true. You've, we've got our lane of travel and they've got theirs and we can each do our own thing. Exactly, yeah. and you merge every, every now and again, but uh -huh. that's fine. Um, and also what struck me at the time was the patience that people have. And I think, I don't know if it's a Pacific Northwest thing, um, because certainly on what I've seen in the East Coast, people aren't, there isn't quite so much time. Mm -hmm. um, but compared to England or where I came from, there's, people are slightly, they haven't got quite so much time always and you know, cutting more corners, which you get here uh -huh. inevitably, um, but not so much of it anyway. It does seem like people are awfully courteous and patient and mm. they'll stop for cyclists almost yes. to a fault anymore. Yeah, uh, on that note actually, the so stop signs, you've obviously got mm -hmm. these stop signs and the all-way stop signs. And on a bike, it's, it's kind of frustrating sometimes having to stop all the time because it requires physical energy. Mm -hmm. When I've been driving around town, I've hired a car a few times, you, can't, you just put your foot on the gas yeah. and off you go. So when I first arrive, you're kind of sailing through some of these stop signs and the cars just sit and wait. And I thought, gosh, these people are very courteous, <laughs> aren't they? And actually what I kind of learned pretty quickly was that I just wasn't obeying the traffic <laughs> laws. So Yes, I think you need to cease forward momentum exactly, at these stop signs. Which I, I do do. <laughs> so. Well, it takes a little while to learn the, the laws yes. of the land, right? Well, yeah. We'll forgive you for that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, why did you come to Portland? I, obviously, I, I think it has to do with the Isle of Bikes, but why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so the, I mean, in terms of the business and the sort of the business model, it's such that we're distributing nationally. So, obviously, the, Portland is a great local market for us, and we'll come on to that, but... Um, it didn't matter from that point of view so much where we were, so long as deliveries could come to us mm -hmm. and we could send bikes out. Sure. We could have almost been in the middle of nowhere. So we, Isla and I came last June um, and looked really Oregon, tight more as a whole, um, and pretty much anywhere we looked at could have worked. Mm -hmm. But there was something think about Portland that just tugged at our heartstrings a bit. The, I mean, it goes out saying that bicycle friendly culture, mm -hmm. the, the infrastructure here, the events, there's always something happening. Um, very yeah, fantastic food. You, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somewhere bad to eat. <laughs> um, and I guess combined, it was, it was really attractive to us. There's easy access to the countryside of, now, for a city of this this size, I've never lived in a city this big. But yeah, you know, within 20 minutes, you're out in the fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which all felt fairly unique. So, although perhaps we didn't have to locate somewhere that's so densely populated by comparison to where we are in England, it we had the luxury of choosing somewhere that perhaps I wanted to live. That so. is a luxury. Now, do I understand that Portland, at least right now, is the only United States Isla Bike store? Yes, that's right. So we've kind of replicated list, pretty much what we've done in the UK in that we've got the one store in England uh -huh. and we're distributing nationally there. Um, so we're doing the same in the States. Whether or not we'll open up something else one day, because obviously it's a much bigger country, uh -huh. um, I don't know. Oh, okay. But but right now, here you are. Yes. And why don't you um, tell us a little bit about Isla Bikes, the company itself then? Sure. So we specialize in quality children's bicycles. Um, the company was founded by Isla Roundtree in 2006. So prior to that, she was a bicycle product designer for a large British um, retailer. And was being asked by friends and family what she'd recommend for their children. Mm -hmm. And looking around, there was nothing that she wholeheartedly could. So she left um, the company she was working for in the fall of 2005 and spent six months um, designing the bike, setting up the business. 
um, and dumpster diving to make ends meet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then in March 2006, I opened in England, very small at the time. It was, we were in a converted cow shed, which had a tendency to leak. <laughs> I remember once opening the door from the office and workshop into the warehouse, and there was just a yeah, three inch um, deep stream oh. flowing through it. But, um, anyway, it's good times. <laughs> So in terms of the bikes, they are the three main things that I guess set, up, set us apart. Number one, they're very lightweight. Mm -hmm. um, so typically they can come up six to 10 pounds lighter um, compared to what else you might find. So for a child who weighs perhaps 40 pounds, proportionally that weight saving is significantly larger when comparing it to an adult. So for us, it might be like riding a bike that weighs 100 pounds or more. Now for your regular bike, you know, you're looking at 25, 30 pounds, obviously less than that for a very nice one. Which makes it so much easier for them to ride, riding uphill, learning uh -huh. to ride. You know, I had a young boy in this afternoon who found, just could lift his bike so easily, straight up, he's uh -huh. five. Um, Whereas it's, we take it for granted almost, we see it all the time. But when you see the parents' reactions to it, it's like, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's sort of heartwarming to see. That, that is a, a great concept. And I know there's more to it as well. But I, I remember mm. getting a bike for my oldest son when he was, you know, about four or five. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's like, okay, this one looks like it's your size. What's your favorite color? Blue. Okay, we're yes. good to go. And didn't even think about any of this stuff. No. <laughs> or it's pink. Oh, look at those tassels. Aren't they great? <laughs> right. On the basket, How on the cute. front. So yeah. But it, it all detracts from the riding experience itself. Um, and ultimately, through intelligent design, which is one of our sort of um, core values is that we like to inspire children to not only want to ride more now um, but continue into adulthood so whether or not that's for utilitarian use mm -hmm. commuting at some stage or recreationally perhaps for health reasons um, we feel that through inspiring them at a young age they're far more likely to continue into later life um, so yeah, weight was one of them, uh -huh. and then there's the ergonomic fit. So if we look at the Rothen here, which is our balance bike uh -huh. um, for approximately two years plus, we've got, and we'll come on to the whole balance bike concept. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about the balance bike. Detail. Okay, so balance bikes, they are, they're not, it's not a new idea, um, but it's relatively new concept in terms of teaching children to ride as opposed to using training wheels. Mm -hmm. So a bike steers by leaning um, and training wheels prevent a bike from leaning. So they just put off the point at which the child is going to have to learn to ride. Now when you take the training wheels off, they almost need to learn to balance. Yes. So the longer that they're on training wheels for, the the longer you're putting off the point at which they're going to learn to ride. And the longer they're on them for, the harder it is to then teach them. So you've almost got two components to learning to ride. You've got the balance mm -hmm. and you've got the pedaling. Yes. Now, learning to pedal is relatively simple by comparison to balance. And balance is a bit like learning to walk. Uh-huh. You know, one, one week a child perhaps hasn't really mastered the balance, three weeks later they they're almost, um, they've moved on so much it's unrecognisable. So balancing, they can often start when they're roughly two. Obviously, it, it varies from child sure. to child, sure. just like walking. But approximately from two years plus, they can start out on the balanced bike and they'll almost walk with the bike between their legs. They won't often use a saddle and just waddle with it. Okay. Just walk very unsteadily. Uh -huh. They'll let go of the bike and it'll fall over because unlike a lot of their toys, they'll stand up. It uh -huh. doesn't. Uh -huh. And that over time will gradually progress to more confident strides. So they'll then start to sit on the saddle and walk with it and that progress to running almost. Uh -huh. 
And then they will lift both legs, at which point they're balancing. And they'll become often more adventurous, going down <laughs> short descents. Sure. Um, and in some cases, really becoming quite frightening for the parents, <laughs> I think. Which is why we fit a brake, um, just to scrub off some of that speed. So a child will often learn to ride somewhere between three and a half and four and a half. Mm -hmm. And when they've learned to balance, as I said, pedaling is relatively simple by comparison, and put them on a bike with pedals, and not for everybody, for a lot of children, they can be riding within half an hour. Now, not necessarily super confidently, yeah. but they're riding, uh -huh. and you can build it from there. Um, whereas the training wheels, I learnt on training wheels, mm -hmm. and I distinctly remember the first time my parents took them off and I was riding around the garden um, I think there were tears involved <laughs> um, I remember hitting the crossbar oh um, but it, I guess it made an impression on me yeah and we'll have people coming to us and they'll be on a balanced bike not necessarily one of ours um, but there's so many out there now you go to a park on a Sunday afternoon and yeah, it's just all over the place. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about this, because mm. most of us were raised with training wheels. And so seeing yeah. these, my, my logic was completely flawed. And you're explaining that the balance is far more important than the pedaling. Um, really helps me understand why these mm. are so important. I mean, many people my age are buying them for their grandchildren, not mm. their own children. But yeah. that was really helpful to, to hear that explanation. Yeah, I think it's just a more natural progression. Uh -huh. um, and they're not having to unlearn what they've learnt with training wheels, uh -huh. which you're having to if you put them on it. It's when we have people coming um, to buy a bike who have been on training wheels, and we recommend supporting them by holding the child underneath their armpits and not the bike. Oh. So if you hold the bike, you're doing the job of the training wheels. Okay. So you might as well fit the training wheels and save yourself the aggravation. <laughs> By holding the child, so being on training wheels, it's so noticeable that they have. Because as they're cornering, you can feel that they are support, they're leaning the other way. Uh -huh. Whereas when they're being on oh, a balanced yeah. bike, they're uh, leaning into the corner. Okay. And you're supporting them an awful lot less. Uh -huh. And it's once you know what you're looking for, it's, you just see it straight away. So training wheels really do kind of ca are counterproductive they in are, a lot of ways. For mo most children, they are. Uh -huh. there, there are some children who really struggle with the balance bikes. It's a very small proportion. Uh -huh. I don't know, but yeah, one or two percent. They just don't show the interest in uh -huh. them or perhaps understand what they're trying to achieve. Um, Usually the younger siblings pick these things up much quicker <laughs> because they're aspiring uh, to be like their older siblings. Uh -huh. That helps. Yes, of <laughs> course. Um, but, for, yeah, vast majority of children. It's so you pointed out here, here this is your littlest mm. bike, and, and it does have a handbrake on it. So That's right. How does a little two-and-a-half-year-old figure out a handbrake? Right, good question. So... When they're starting out on it, which for some children it might be two, it might be three. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously all children vary in size. So when they're waddling with it, um, letting go and dropping it, the, the brake's not being used. But when they become far more mobile on it, then they do start to use the brakes, really just to scrub off some of the speed. So to make that easier, and actually the very early Rothans didn't have a brake because there wasn't a brake lever available that a child of that age could effectively use. Uh -huh. We could have fitted one, but it wouldn't really have added it wouldn't have added anything. So we've there are own components, because again we just couldn't source them, the very small diameter handlebars mm -hmm. and then also the handlebar grips. So I guess the best comparison for an adult would be a scaffolding pole. Do you it, call that here? It, well, I think I know what you're talking uh, about. So like a steel pole yeah, that yeah. you use out. It would be huge. Exactly. And that's what a, a regular adult handlebar would be like, uh -huh. which is what you often see. 
Um, so that combined with our own brake lever, which Isla designed and we've opened moulds for, very short reach and light action. Uh -huh. So once the children are more mobile, it's sort of two and a half, three, they can actually reach it and apply it. And as you can see, the reach here at the bite point yeah. is tiny. Yeah. Um, and just like an adult would just have their fingertips there on the brake and feather it, a two and a half year old can do the same. And they, I, I know my boys, it seems like they'd figure that out pretty quickly. It's fairly it's a, yeah. intuitive. It, yeah. Off, like a lot of things, you, you know, you show them once, you can perhaps get them to walk with the bike mm -hmm. and apply it a few times and they pick it up yeah. quickly. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of children that have not used hand brakes because they've be only been on a bike with a coaster brake. Right. Um, particularly in the States mm -hmm. because the coaster brakes are a legal requirement on a certain size bike. Oh. Um, so when we're then introducing to the hand brakes, we give them a quick tutorial and yeah, they pick it up really quickly. So how do you transition the child from this mm. to a pedal bike, a regular bike? You, so the avoid training wheels, mm -hmm. and this is something we come across quite often, that obviously we're very new to the US market, there are not many Rothans out there, which no. is the name of our small balance bike mm -hmm. here. Um, so people, but there are an awful lot of balance bikes out there now. So children, parents are coming to us and looking for the first bike with pedals, and quite often, um, will be asked for training wheels as well. Um, now the, the whole idea with the balance bike is that you avoid the training wheel route. So we spend quite a bit of time trying to dissuade people <laughs> from buying training wheels. As nice as it would be to sell a bit more, you know, look, really, for the child's sake, you're better off avoiding them. So to make the transition, pretty much jump in with the pedals and the balance. Uh -huh. Um, set and saddle height correctly so that the child usually, um, depending on the, if it's one of our bikes, it'd usually be so that the child can get the ball of their foot, both feet on the ground when they're sat on the saddle, but different makes are going to vary. Sure. Um, but really supporting them from behind. So flat, paved area, ideal, uh -huh. so it's much easier to gain momentum. Grass is great because if they fall off, but it's harder right. to gain momentum. Right. Um, so parks obviously are great. Mm -hmm. um, closed car parks, parking lots. Um, then supporting them from behind. So underneath their armpits, so that they can feel the bike leaning and you can feel how much support you're having to provide. For a child who's been on a balanced bike, it's not usually that much mm -hmm. support you're having to provide for them. And that gradually, you, that you'll loosen your grip as you can feel they're having to depend on you less. And if pedaling's new to them, which usually it is, uh -huh. as they're coming off a balanced bike, they often pedal backwards. I mean, why not? Yeah. Pedal backwards, yeah. pedal forwards. Uh -huh. At that age, it makes just as so much sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you can also just push gently push them along, because otherwise they're just continuously stopping quite often. Um, just gently push them, you can have hold, hold the pedal just so they get the idea of, you know, you've got to pedal oh, forwards, sure. clockwise direction. Uh -huh. And very quickly, that will progress to them riding. And by having a brake on the balance bike, it introduces them to braking, because almost counterintuitively, they learn to ride first and then they learn to stop. <laughs> so you kind of set them up and then they don't know how to stop. So, so you need to cover that before you like send them down a hill. Ideally, <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I will, we want to talk about some of the other bikes moving on to, you know, bigger kids and, and the idea of kids' bikes that they can join us on some of our rides because mm. with a lighter bike or a bike that really works for them, mm -hmm. they're more able to join adults in adult-type rides maybe earlier than, than they would be. Yeah. So we'll talk about that here really shortly, but first I'd like to go to a video, and we've got a video about riding smart, 
And so we'll go to that video, and then we'll come back to Tim Goodall, and we'll talk some more about Isla Bikes and helping find a good bike for your child. Game. You Fair cheated. What? No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Hey, Gally, what's, what's up? up? <laughs> what happened? Then? Well, I was riding along the road and I skidded and fell off my bike. <laughs> Weren't you wearing your helmet? No, helmets look dorky. That band aid looks real good. Well, whatever. It didn't mess up my hair at least. Kelly, you really could have gotten hurt. Girls. Well, thanks for being concerned. I'm not kidding. You really could have hurt yourself. Well, it's not like I had brain damage or something. It's only a little scrape. Since you brought it up, let's talk about brains. Check this out. When you ride one of these, you should wear one of these. Here's why. Pretend your head is a bowl of jello. Your brain is the jello, and your skull is the bowl that holds the jello. Now, you may not realize it, but if you crash or fall off your bike and hit your head, your brain actually moves around in your skull, like this. Hit your head too hard, the bowl breaks, and the jello oozes out of the cracks of the bowl. And you've got a brain injury. What's that like? Well, I've never had one, and I don't want to find out, but I've been told life gets real confusing. Right now, you would understand me if I were to say, hey, looks like a great day for a bike ride. With a brain injury, that same sentence might sound like, great, hey, bike it, ride, looks like, for a day. Besides that, with a brain injury, sometimes you can't do things like tie your shoes, go to the bathroom by yourself, or even smell such mm. awesome things as pepperoni pizza. Brain injuries are not cool. So be smart. Wear a helmet. They're proven to be almost 90% effective in preventing a brain injury that may last the rest of your life. And may also help your face from getting all messed up in a crash. So how do you find the right helmet to protect yourself? It's easy. Check it out. Pretty much any store that sells bikes has helmets. They come in all kinds of cool designs and colors. So you're sure to find one you like. They also come in different sizes. Make sure you get one that fits you today, not one you'll grow into. And pay attention, this is important. Look for a sticker inside the helmet that says CPSC. This means the helmet meets the Consumer Product Safety Commission standards to help protect you from those nasty head injuries we talked about earlier. If you don't see this sticker, don't buy the helmet. Want some more proof that riding with the helmet is smart? Take Exhibit A, for example. This helmet was worn by a nine-year-old girl in Tennessee. She was riding home from a friend's house when she lost control in some loose gravel. She took quite a spill, but thanks to this, no head injury. Exhibit B. This one looks a little rough. A 10-year-old boy from New Jersey was cruising down the road when a neighbor pulled out of his driveway and didn't see him coming. Today he's just fine, but imagine what could have happened to his head if he hadn't been wearing his helmet. Scary. And finally, Exhibit C. How many of you have ever gone down a big hill on your bike? Pretty fun stuff, huh? Until you hit your front tire on a little rock. That's what happened to a seven-year-old boy in Colorado. He lost control, hit a tree. Thanks to this, which got pretty messed up in the process, he walked yeah. away with only a broken wrist. Broken in the front and got scrapes all over. A crash this hard 
would have done a number to his head, messing him up for the rest of his life. So, how do you tell if your helmet fits the way it's supposed to? Here's the deal about helmets. They're lightweight, they're well ventilated, and they come in more designs and colors than you ever dreamed possible. But the most important thing is this. They protect your head and your brain in case you crash or fall. The first step in making sure the helmet fits is knowing the front from the back. Now you're looking at the front, and here's the back. What you do is fit the helmet snugly on your head like this. Don't tip it too far back, or don't tip it too far forward. It should be level on your head like this. Low on your forehead to withstand any blow. Low enough so that only two fingers fit between your helmet and your eyebrows. The helmet should be nice and snug on your head so that it doesn't wiggle around. If the helmet isn't snug, just add some of these handy Velcro pads that come with the helmet. Remember, snug is good, wiggly is bad. The two side straps should meet in a V under each ear, like this, and the chin strap should be adjusted so that if you open your mouth, the helmet gets pulled down a bit. There, he's all set for a ride. Helmet level, two fingers above the eyebrow, and snug enough so that it won't wiggle around. It takes a few minutes to make sure your helmet's on right, but it's easy, and it's worth it. See you later. Ding, ding, ding. Now don't forget, a good helmet fit is as important as wearing one. And if you have little brothers or sisters, there are special helmets for them that cover more of their head to give them lots of protection. And your parents, they should be wearing a helmet also. And don't forget the rules of the road. Ride single file in the same direction as traffic. Obey traffic signs and signals. Signal your turns and look behind you before you turn. And always stay alert. Remember guys, wearing your bike helmet is the single most important thing you can do for your safety. Let's say this is you. If you crash or fall off your bike, yeah. ouch. I don't care how tough you think you are, you could really get messed up. Now here's you in a helmet. Ooh. Hey, cool. Yeah. You're A-OK -okay and looking smart. So just think of your helmet as part of your gear. You don't see a soccer player without shin guards. You don't see a basketball player without shoes. You don't ride your bike without your helmet. It's part of the gear. Ride, ride safe, safe, ride, ride smart. smart. It's, it's time, time to start today. today. Well, that's a great video for adults or children. And you notice how at the end there, the, the helmets were fitting on the children's heads coming down over their forehead not like a bonnet sitting perched on the back of their head and their straps were nice and snug under their chin and uh, up against their ears so a good helmet fitting is really important and um, all of us need to be wearing our helmets and having them fit right so they'll do the job if they need to thank you for joining us we're back now with tim goodall and he's telling us about isla bikes which happens to be a brand of bikes that is made especially for children and we've been talking about the idea of a balanced bike many of us grew up with bikes that use training wheels and things and maybe there's a better way to do that to get kids on bikes so we've kind of considered that concept and gotten educated about that and now uh, we're going to talk about some of the other Isla bikes there are a lot of them for kids and we'll talk to Tim about some of that so Tim um, you've mm -hmm. really been educating us about this this balanced bike idea, but you have a lot of other styles of bikes. Why don't you tell us about that? that you've got a stair step of bikes, lots of bikes. We have, yes. <laughs> so, obviously, the Rothens is the start, the starter bike, essentially. So, then leading on from this one, um, we've got two starter bikes with pedals, if you like. Um, depending on the size of the child, they usually move into one or the other. So, when children are very young, they need to adopt almost a completely upright, vertical back. 
Um, so as a result, we have BMX style handlebars. They look like BMXs, but they're not. Uh-huh. And the reason for needing the uprights back is that if they are leaning too far forward, so like in a quite sporting position that you might see on a sort of mountain bike or road bike, uh -huh. um, it's actually compressing their organs and their upper chest cavity. So when they're very young, sit very upright, and as they grow, you'll gradually move them into a more sporting position. Oh. Uh -huh. and they'll distribute their weight a little bit more. Um, I mean, some people find the very upright position very comfortable anyway, and mm -hmm. they'll continue like that. Um, so yeah, that's our sort of start, first starter bike. Um, single speed, you can fit fenders to it. So which is, they look really cute with the fenders, actually. <laughs> and then moving on from that, we've got what we call the Ben range, of which the bike here behind us is one of them. And this is perhaps one of the more most versatile so children can rough not on this size but the size down start on it from roughly five plus mm -hmm. up to 11 12 13 years of age and intention with them is that and really with all the bikes but they're as versatile as possible so with children you just don't know which way their riding is going to go um, you know, one month or one year, yeah. they're all into mountain biking, and then the next they want to be riding to school or you know, racing of some description. So they can be fitted with fenders, the racks, you can change the tyres out if they're going to be doing more serious mountain biking, so fit a knobbly mountain bike tyre or a skinnier road tyre. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a bit more of a do it all, whereas someone who's really into their biking might have a bike for every discipline, a, a road bike, a cyclocross bike, a bike for commuting, a mountain bike. But for kids, as they're growing, it's, it can get a bit expensive yes. if they don't have so many. Um, and then after this one, we've got the Krieg, which is of a hard tail mountain bike. So essentially it's got front suspension and disc brakes. Now, we don't fit suspension to the Ben range because unless you're going to fit a really quality suspension fork, the children generally aren't heavy enough to overcome static friction in the stanchions. So they just add lots of weight. They might add a little bit of kudos within the social circles, uh -huh. but they're adding weight and really inhibiting the child. Um, so on the Kriegs, we, we fit... Um, a quality fork and there's obviously a price tag to boot. But they're some more serious mountain biking, yeah. unless they're going to be doing 90 percent of the riding on sort of single track trails, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Then it's the Ben range is better suited. But the Krieg, it for the riders who use them, they ride them pretty hard and they get so much enjoyment out of them. Um, so that's quite they're quite specific. And then you've got the Luaths which are our dropped handlebarred road, so cyclocross bikes. So cyclocross bikes, I'm sure you know, very similar mm -hmm. to road bikes. Yes. Got clearance for slightly wider tyres so they can be ridden off-road. Uh -huh. um, and then cantilever brakes. So oh, again, right. mud doesn't clog up. Uh -huh. um, and again, you fit fenders to those racks, uh -huh. and use them for cycle touring. And things um, and since Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France last year back home so in you've mentioned England, more than once already tonight I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, well hey <laughs> so yeah since he won the Luas have been so popular the kids oh. just want to ride what their new heroes riding they aspire to uh -huh. be like him it's football or soccer uh -huh. it's so big in England, but cycling is gathering pace for sure. Well, that's that's neat. That, so, yeah, that, it's great to see. For sure. And and again, so the everything is just a little smaller dimensioned, so mm. that it fits and and. Um, yeah, that's right. So as the bikes, as you move up through the range, everything gets a little bit bigger. Uh huh. Um, so the you know, on the smaller bikes here, we've designed our own pedals. And then as, as they move up the range, they get slightly larger and the crank lengths here. I won't go into all the detail for uh -huh. the reason for needing the short crank lengths, but it has a very profound impact, the crank length, 
on the riding position, how easy it is to reach the ground, etc. So I, th I think it's seven moulds we've opened so that we could get the right length cranks because they just weren't available again. Um, the saddles, which you probably can't see so easily, but again, design those. So for an adult, they look dreadfully uncomfortable. Yes. But they, I think they're my favourite part. They look <laughs> so cute. Because we found that the children, on even the small saddles, they flared so much at the back. Uh -huh. And children can't, just can't spread their legs far enough apart. So they're sort of perched oh, okay. on the front of it, uh -huh. which really isn't very comfortable either. Yeah. You guys have thought of everything, and you've really thought of the anatomy and just mm. everything. It's, it's really impressive. Well, oh, thank you. It's, yeah, a lot of, and the credit's really got to go to Isla. Um, she's the brains behind it and has done a lot of work looking at the anatomy of children and really observing them riding as well. Uh -huh. the, the range we've got now, um, the, they came out last July, August in England, and it's the first really big update, um, improvement that we had since we opened. Uh -huh. And even when everything's been finalised, Isla's thinking about what she can do next to improve. Oh, we can tweak this, tweak that. Um, and there's just an ongoing process of improvement, observing the children, etc. Well, so it shows. Um, tell us a little bit, you, you've got names for all these bikes. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the names that you're calling these bikes. It's, uh, it's on the bike, our it viewers is. probably can't see, but tell us about that. Um, so, first of all, the Isla Bikes. So I think Isla Bikes, it comes from Isla, uh -huh. um, who founded the business. And the name Isla comes from an island off the Scottish west coast. It's in the Inner Hebrides, which is an archipelago. Um, that actually... Very, it's very remote, but that's where Isla's name comes from. And as a result, the model names are all Scottish Gaelic. Okay. So, um, Rothan, which is our small balance bike, is w means wheels. Uh huh. The Knock, which is the bike that size-wise sits between our little balance bike and the bike that we've got behind us here. Um, so Knock. Is Spelt C N O C, but it's pronounced knock like knocking on a door. Uh -huh. um, is small mound or hillock. <laughs> um, ben is Gaelic for mountain. So Ben Nevis is the highest peak in the UK. I think it stands at fourteen, just over fourteen hundred meters, uh -huh. which sounds tiny in comparison <laughs> to what we've got <laughs> here in Oregon, but we're proud of it nonetheless. So that's. Ben Nevis, and that's where Ben comes from. Um, Krieg, which is our mountain bike with the suspension forks, uh -huh. is rocky, rocky outcrop. And then Luath is fast or speedy. So they're very appropriately named. Yeah, we certainly try. Yeah. So it's, they're not completely random. Now, I, you and I were talking, some of your, your biggest bike mm. is really a small adult looking road bike and and I was saying yeah. you know there's some very petite women that it seems like that would be good for but you're saying maybe maybe not and tell us about that yeah you see so in our show we've got all the bikes laid out mm -hmm. and because our largest Luath which is our road style bike um, has got full-size wheels like you'd find on an adult's road bike uh-huh um, a lot of people's first reaction is oh that would fit me yeah you know they're, they're six feet tall <laughs> And actually, the proportions of a growing child differ somewhat to those of a fully grown adult. So we do get a lot of, particularly small women, really struggling to find something that fits. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of the manufacturers are bringing out what they call women-specific designs or something along those lines. But even so, it still doesn't suit everybody. So they come to us and really trying to find something. Yeah. For some people, it, they fit great, mm -hmm. absolutely love them. Um, you know, the best bike they've tried, certainly within the price brackets. And for others, because the geometry of the frame is designed around the proportions of a growing child, mm -hmm. a growing child tends to have very long limbs and a short upper body. 
in comparison to the proportions of an adult. So as a result, the seat tube here um, is proportion again quite long compared to that you'd find on a similar sized adult sure. bike. And you've got a very, relatively short top tube. So they tend to be sat really quite upright on the bikes. Oh, okay. There are a few things you can do to tweak the position. Mm -hmm. um, they're not always a great fit, as I say, but for, for other people, yeah. it's a revelation. Might be worth a, worth a try. And, and two, a lot, a lot of women have the really small, delicate hands, yeah. and, and they can't reach their, the adult-sized brakes. All mm. that stuff is a problem for them. And that's, we hear that so often as well. Um, because the handlebar grips on all the bikes, we've opened moulds for ourselves, so they're very small diameter, uh -huh. and obviously with the short reach brake levers. So, Now, you, were, um, you and I had talked about a, a kid in, in England that mm. was riding one of the road bikes and was yes. able to, I mean, we kind of, before we went to the brake, talked about the idea that your children can't keep up with you on their bikes because they're very heavy and they just can't go very far. Mm. But if you had the right bike, maybe they could ride farther and you could do some trips. So tell us about this little guy. I think it was a little little boy. Yeah, it was. I, it was summer of 2011, I think it was. So back in England where Isla Bikes is situated, we're on the shortest route from Land's End to John O'Groats. So Land's End is the most southerly point and uh -huh. John O'Groats is the most northerly. So it's essentially the furthest you can ride in the country. <laughs> we don't have the luxury of however many thousand miles it is across the country right. here. So I think it's just 700 and something miles. So his summer vacation was spent with his father and uncle, I think it was, riding from Land's End to John O'Groats over three weeks and they stopped by the store where they had bought the bike a year or so earlier, um, really the first opportunity to say hello, which was fantastic. It's, I think a lot of us there were so envious of him. It was <laughs> yeah. like, we have done that as kids. <laughs> really? Um, but it, it was lovely to see. It is, because just helping your child enjoy a sport that maybe you enjoy and that they're enjoying, and to really have an adventure, mm. more than just riding around the block or down to the store, but really getting out there and enjoying an adult-type activity. Yeah. And I don't know, I just, wow, the, the bonding that must have taken place and all the fun that they had. I think so, and it's something, I think, certainly from what we hear, so a lot of parents who are very keen on riding themselves really want to share that with the kids. Um, and you know, the same parents will go out and spend an awful lot on their own bikes and perhaps recognise the difference the lightweight bikes can make yeah. to the child's ability to ride further. They're same effort, but they can ride an extra 10 or 20 miles. No doubt. So. Well, let's, we're just about out of time. Let's go to a real quick video about Beaverton Banks and beyond because I want our viewers to have the opportunity to do that ride and then we'll come back and, and close up with Tim. Thank you. <laughs> you'll come out and join us on Beaverton Banks and Beyond Bicycle Tour August 24th. As we wrap up with Tim, Tim, why don't you tell us where Isla Bikes is located in Portland, Oregon? 
Right, so we are on um, South East 7th, 2113. It's between Lincoln and Grant, which are two blocks north of Division. We don't have a sign up yet. Um, uh -huh. So it's a grey building with a red front door. With a red front door. And there's a bike lane that goes by there. So you could ride your exactly. bike there to yes. go look to see what's there. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for joining us well, and, and telling us a little bit about your transition to Portland from England mm. and these, these wonderful bikes and just the idea that uh, there's something maybe better for children to help them be bicycle riders. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to come and bring some of your product. No, thank you for having me. And thank all of you for joining us. I hope you learned something and give, given a little thought about how to buy a bike for a child. Uh, I want to welcome you again to the Beaverton Banks and Beyond Bicycle Tour. We were selling jerseys for the tour. It's a great jersey. If you go to our website, you'll be able to see it. And we did close out that order for the jerseys that will be available at the ride. But since there was so much interest, we've opened, we're going to open up that, those orders again and have a Northwest Bicycle Safety Council jersey with that design on it. So there's still opportunity. And it's a beautiful jersey. It's got a lot of white and black and red. And if you're only going to get one jersey this year, I'd encourage you to take a look at that one because it's very unique and special. And you'll enjoy wearing it and you'll enjoy the nice comments you get wearing it. I hope you've been out riding your bike. It's June now and the weather's getting nicer and the days are long and there's just a lot of opportunity to ride. Please ride safely and obey the laws, as Tim commented earlier in the show, that learning to stop at the stop signs, that's one thing we want to learn. And using the bike lanes, if there's a bike lane as a bicyclist, you need to be in it. That's your lane of travel. And wearing a helmet at all times. Um, unfortunately, they come into play even when you don't expect it, whether you're a few feet from your home or 25 miles from your home, you might need a, a helmet. So please wear one and wear it properly so it can do its job. Bruce Buffington and I, the producer of this show and the president of Northwest Bicycle Safety Council, lead a lot of rides. And if you go to pwtc.com and look at rides, you'll see our names listed there as ride leaders. Come out and join us. We'll help you get into cycling and uh, learn to join in all the fun. Thank you for joining us.